Yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm going to try to give you a, a quick overview of um, recent observations and findings um, um, about uh, earthquake nucleation. So that's really um, observational seismology, a bit different than what we've seen this week, but uh, I guess of interest anyway. So um, anytime um, um, there's a main shock with some uh, precursory signal, and here we're talking mainly about four shocks, so small earthquakes occurring before the main shock. Um, uh, well, first of all, it doesn't happen all the time. Most of the main shocks are not preceded by anything, but uh, uh, some of them are, and um, uh, I will describe um, um, two, at least two sequences uh, in this talk where there are uh, such pre precursory information. Uh, every time there is, um, you know, these four shock sequences, uh, we try to understand whether um, these four shocks are either um, earthquakes triggering each other. So it's a, oops, sorry, it's a cascade. Really, is a cascade model. So these are the four shocks triggering in chain. Um, uh, the f future four shocks, and then one of the four shocks happens to be big, and that's the main shock. So that's really a cascade model. Um, and the second model um, that people think uh, about is uh, more complicated to, um, um, to study is uh, what we call a pre-slip model. So that's basically some slow slip, so that doesn't emit waves. So that cannot be detected directly. So you have to have uh, some uh, indirect measure. Um, and this pre-slip uh, is basically um, accelerating towards failure and then there's a main shock. So uh, it's somewhat uh, not really a cascade anymore, it's an acceleration of a slow slip um, um, towards a seismic rupture. Um, and in both cases, what we have um, um, at hand is, um, as, as, as um, an observable, is uh, the four shocks. So you have uh, these guys here that, uh, um, that occur uh, before the main shock, and basically the analogy is one with the dominoes. So th in this case, is you know, they all fall, you know, they make each other fall in, in chain, while here they're too far apart, so they cannot actually touch each other. So if they all fall, you know, within a given duration, that's basically due to something else. That's not, you know, the domino, you know, pushing, you know, over domino. So you have to have, you know, the whole table shaking in that case. So that's something a seismic that's going on. So in the lab, things are somewhat more easy to understand and uh, there have been several um, very good friction experiments so i'm gonna here show one of them that i kind kind of like which was done by stefan Nielsen, who is in in durham now but at the time he was in in rome at the ingv and what he did was a, a, a simple friction experiment with two um, uh, transparent blocks here and um, and um, waiting for the instability to nucleate, and then he was uh, following this uh, by photogrammetry, and you can see the the slip front here. And what you you can you can see in in, in this experiment um, is after some time you see the rupture itself, so propagating at uh, at a Rayleigh way uh, really speed here, and there's even the a hint of a super shear branch here. But before uh, this rupture, you can see that for uh, about uh, 300 microseconds there was something else before and and propagating very slowly um, so that again would not emit any mechanical waves or with very little energy so you cannot actually see it, see it. and that's basically the, the nucleation itself um, so this can be actually reproduced numerically, and that's uh, something that um, Kaneko and Ampro have done uh, using rate and set friction models. So that's that has been derived from lab experiment. And if you um, if you have a velocity weakening uh, per fault here, and if you look really at uh, if you zoom in at really where the rupture begins, you can actually see the slow front and and accelerating into um, a seismic instability. You can really reproduce. So uh, it's it's so these experiments have been um, you know uh, conducted uh, for uh, more than um, for 30 years now and and one uh, possibly the famous one because it was one of the first was due to Onaka and where he was sliding two two uh, blocks of rock 
And uh, he had slip gauges here um, uh, along the slip interface, and you can basically see exactly the same thing, so a slow front and accelerating into seismic uh, instability. So these, these experiments have been really, um, uh, have really made a, a strong impact because uh, for the first time people were convinced that we could possibly see something before earthquakes, so some kind of a nucleation. The difficulty here in, 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 in this approach is that you have to have a measure of the slip. So in, in Onaka case, or Nielsen case, in both cases, you, you actually measure or, 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 or are able to monitor the slip front. Um, with real earthquakes, it's um, not possible because uh, the nucleation, if it, if it happens, occurs at depth, something like 10 to 20 kilometers depth, and you don't have any direct slip measurement. So what do you do with this? And the question is really, what about natural earthquakes? Can we actually see some kind of a nucleation phase as well before the rupture? So um, in order to do this, what, um, what you have uh, um, uh, as, as data is really just the foreshocks, whenever there are foreshocks that are detected. So I'm gonna give you two examples um, uh, to show you what, what can be done. And this one is, uh, uh, before the destructive 1999 uh, uh, Izmit earthquakes in Turkey on the North Anatolian Fault, very close to Istanbul. So that's the hypocenter here, and that's it's the, the rupture trace here, uh, about a, a bit more than 100 kilometers. And um, what is interesting in this sequence is that it was preceded by a foreshock um, um, cluster. So that's uh, in, in the insert here, you see that's time in minutes before the main shock. That so that's this guy here is actually the main shock here, and that's in, in the y axis is the magnitude, the moment ma magnitude. And what you see, all uh, there are about 24 shocks before of magnitude 1, 2, 3, about. And what is very fascinating, and that was shown in 2011 by uh, Michel Bouchon and co-authors, is that um, all these four shocks here, that's so they are, what we're looking at here is the uh, velocity uh, waveforms um, at this station here, which is the closest to the hypocenter. And all these waveforms look very much uh, similar, uh, all of them, and if you align them, you can actually see that the P wave arrival and the S wave arrival occur exactly at the with the same um, time gap. And that means that they actually come from the same spot. Uh, accuracy is about 20 meters here in that case. And you can actually superpose the two the first two big four shocks, so about magnitude three, and, and really it's impossible to distinguish them visually. So the argument was that, you know, these 24 shocks actually occur exactly at the same place. It's the same asperity breaking over, you know, 20 times in a space of 45 minutes. And in order to have this, it's basically a whole portion of the fault that is starting to slip and only this asperity is actually resisting, you know. So it has, you know, this asperity is being reloaded at a fast rate. So it's a really the pre-slip model that um, that seems to see um, uh, that, that, that seems to be responsible for this foreshock sequence. And actually, the last foreshock, which is actually the main shock itself, looks exactly of it at the very beginning. It it cannot be distinguished from the others. It's just that you know it it can you know go away and and reach over asperities while the other uh, you know were confined to the same asperity. Yes. Exact. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's what it is. Yes, yes. Mm, yep, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. No, but I, I, I will show now in the, in the next two minutes that uh, it's been debated and, uh, but, um, and, and to show you the limits of nowadays data. But um, okay, so really that's uh, okay. So uh, Michel and, and, and Okay, so we're uh, claiming that uh, they were observing this pre-sleep. 
Now it's been actually, um, uh, this foreshock sequence has been reanalyzed last year. And, and by two colleagues that have actually used over the other stations here. So uh, Michel only used this station here, the closest, but there, um, um, the new study, you know, used you know the other stations. And what they did was um, because they had uh, extra waveforms to exploit, uh, they were able actually to relocate um, the earthquakes really on 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 the fault and actually to compute uh, to estimate anyway uh, a rupture size. So. That's uh, Ellsworth and Bulut. That's a paper published last year. And what you see here is uh, the four uh, biggest four shocks here, and that's a time frame. So that's the first one. And you see a cross, cr a cross section here. It's that the distance along strike, and that's a depth here. And that's so that's the first big four shock about magnitude three occurring here. And the next one will occur there, and that's this guy here. And what you see in color is their estimate of the rupture size. And so on, and the third foreshock is this big guy here. They don't color it, but it happens here. And then the next one is here, and then the main shock will occur there. And two, I mean, according to them, it's more like a triggering, you know, chain triggering. So very different, because in this case, it's not exactly the same as parity breaking over and over again. But, okay, so to the uh, in, this, in this view, it's more the cascade model. Okay, now, if you look in detail what at what they did, and and I mean, um, BLS were who was uh, main co main author here. I mean, was made it very clear that there is um, um, their estimate of the stress drop is quite high. So um, the mean stress drop on average for all, all earthquakes and it's magnitude independent is about min uh, three megapascals, and it's been known for quite a while. And plus minus a factor of 10 about. And for example, the best study, well, I know I'm aware um, of, is the one by Shear et al, where they were able to actually estimate the stress drops for uh, um, uh, more than 10,000 um, uh, uh, California earthquakes of magnitude 1.5 to 3. So about the same size as the four shocks of the Ismith earthquake. And th they did an ex a, a quite an exhaustive study because uh, in order to compute the stress drop, you have to compute, uh, to look at pairs of earthquakes that are close by, uh, well, that's the best way of doing it, and, and compute um, um, a spectral ratio and get the corner frequency. That's a bit tricky, but when you play with uh, extensive data sets like Shira et al. did, you can actually uh, you know, work on, on a, a large number of pairs, so the distribution of stress drops here is quite robust. And in this case here, it's the best distribution where there are mo more stations that are being triggered by the signal. And you can see that for these guys here, the um, in, uh, a 70 to 80 megapascal stress drop is extremely rare. Yes? Okay, well, the stress drop is basically the, you know, well, the, the static, the st well, it's a static, or it's, it's, it's a static friction times, um, you know, the normal stress down to the dynamic stress. So it's a loss of, you know, the loss of stress. Okay, on th uh, so on, on the rupture, yeah, on the rupture itself. So it's a shear stress, yes. Okay, so yeah. it's how much, you know, the fault has lost. Yeah. So uh, again, yeah, this stress drop is uh, magnitude independent, what that's have been done, uh, known for quite a while. And, but these values here are, are, are very high and they're very anomalous. And uh, I mean, uh, it's difficult to give the whole details of you know, how this is computed, but uh, when you only have four sh shocks here, um, those values are actually quite uncertain. And it's quite important because the stress drop is directly inversional, uh, invers uh, inversely proportional to the rupture size so if you have very high stress drops, you have a very small rupture size. That's why in their view, in their image, um, the rupture here is, is very compact for a magnitude three. Uh, this guy here has you know, a, a stress drop according to them of 2.3 megapascal, so it's about the right size on average, on average. I'm not saying that it's not possible that these you know, stress drops are, can be so high, but it's very unlikely. <laughs> so. If they were all this size, you know, they would overlap, actually. Well, you know, with the stress drop that are possibly too large, you end up with, um, you know, um, not uh, non-overlapping uh, ruptures, and, and you, you end up with very, very different, you know, um, uh, model. So, um, 
okay? So even in a very um, nice case when you have, you know, um, four shocks that look very similar, so you can actually relocate them very accurately, it's still difficult to tell whether, you know, um, you end up, you, you observe pre-sleep or not. So that's where we are at the moment, at least for this sequence. And so what about, uh, you know, um, even less favorable sequences? Can we, can we say something? And I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, um, uh, uh, describe what we found uh, before the 2011 uh, megathrust uh, Tohoku uh, earthquake that, that led to the Fukushima um, uh, disaster. Um, and here what we're seeing is um, uh, the activity, seismic activity um, along the Japan Trench here, that's a trench, that's uh, the Honshu coastline, well some of it anyway, and that's the hypocenter of the 2011 earthquake here, which basically ruptures this whole zone here. And so for two years, I mean, that's basically the Japanese subduction is quite active, okay? And for two months before the main shock, you see this swarm of activity close to the hypocenter. And then two days before uh, the main shock, there was a minute 7.3 for shock that trigger its own aftershock. And that's basically what you see here. So a lot of activity very close to the hypocenter. And here, that's a time series of the uh, seismic activity uh, nearby the, the main shock. And uh, you see that it's strongly accelerating and culminating with this strong acceleration two days before. So the question is, you know, how much of this four shock sequence is actually just earthquakes triggering each other, or can it be due to something else like pre-sleep? So what we, in order to answer this, what we need to know is whether the four shocks could be aftershocks of previous four shocks or not. So we, we're going to try to estimate whether, you know, it's a cascade model or pre-sleep model. And in order to do this, we're going to basically redo the same analogy with the dominoes. We're going to try to see if they're close by, uh, if, there is if, if they're close together, so, so they could actually trigger each other, or if they're too far apart, so if they couldn't trigger each, each other. But we're going to look at the distance in space and in time as well. Okay, so the details, um, uh, are it's, a, it's a probabilistic approach, so it's what we call um, a a stochastic or probabilistic declustering, and, and from what I've heard this week, um, some of you actually try to cluster events, while here we try to decluster events, but it's basically the same process as I will try to explain, and that can be done in an objective way. So, um, so uh, in order, uh, we, we don't actually try to find one ancestor to each event, we, tr we actually compute probabilities. So for any given earthquake, we try to compute the probability that it was triggered by all the previous earthquakes. So, you know, the first earthquake, you know, could have triggered it by with a 10% chance and so on and so on and so on. And so, on. Okay. so we give a full probabilistic, um, um, you know, description of the triggering. And in order to do this, um, uh, we use, well, bias theorem anyway, but uh, we, we use this kernel, uh, this triggering kernel here, which describes the probability that uh, this force shock triggers this earthquake. And it depends on the volume you're looking at, the interval in time and in, s in, in magnitude. And, and uh, using bias theorem, you can, if you know the triggering kernel here, which I will describe later, you can come up with uh, an estimate of the probability. Okay, and you also have to account for the near hypothesis that the earthquake wasn't triggered by, so by previous earthquake, but was spontaneous, so could have been actually triggered by something as seismic. And that's this probability here with, uh, it's not a kernel, but it's a ray density, that's a background ray density that we, we need to estimate as well from the data. So if you can actually um, uh, give values for mu and a model here for the triggering kernel, you can compute this chain or this probability of triggering. Now, um, the, the assumption here is that uh, um, uh, the triggering is linear. So if you have two main shocks, they will trigger uh, their own aftershock sequence. And the total aftershock sequence is basically the superposition of the two aftershock sequences. Uh, is it the case? Actually, it's not according to rate and state, uh, but, um, uh, so I, I'm going to be quick here, but uh, it's only, it's, uh, rate and state is actually a nonlinear model, and that's uh, our best knowledge of, um, you know, how friction could, mm, you know, be uh, exploited or uh, used in order to predict, um, you know, aftershocks. So rate and state predict that, um, you know, triggering is nonlinear, but the 
the departure from, from nonlinearity is actually uh, only significant when the two main shocks are close by uh, in time, and this departure basically vanishes quite quickly, and the total number of aftershocks trigger is actually linear. It doesn't depend, uh, it's even in the case of, of um, uh, rate and state. And there are other ingredients that we're going to use. Um, uh, rate and state predict that uh, there is a number is low, so the aftershock rate decays as 1 over t. The aftershock actually density decays as uh, a power law with space, and the productivity low, so the total number of uh, aftershocks actually grows uh, as, so as a power law with a, uh, a seismic uh, moment. So all these ingredients are actually in the rate and set, except that rate and set is nonlinear. So what we do is we actually use a linear version of the rate and set model, which happens to be um, a model that actually precedes, uh, in historically speaking, uh, the rate and set model, which is the ETA space-time model. And uh, it's basically is a rate and set linear version, a linear version of a rate and set friction. And, um, and so we basically keep the all the ingredients we've seen that uh, have been uh, discussed here already this week. And we use them to uh, parameterize a form for the triggering kernel. So you still get the productivity low, you get the Morris low, and you get here um, um, a density that decays uh, with the distance as a power law. So with this, all these ingredients, you can actually use, uh, w well, we use an expectation maximization algorithm in order to compute everything, so all the parameters, given the data here, so these parameters are optimized, and then you can compute the whole probability, so it's a whole matrix of probabilities, and, and, and yes, and from this you can actually, here I'm not going to look at the clusters, I'm going to look at the, at the declustered part of the data, so, um, uh, in the example of the uh, um, uh, Tohoku uh, earthquake, if you look at the seismicity, so the uh, earthquake, the main shock occur, uh, hypocenter was here, so we're looking here at the zone here, uh, an area that was the one that was activated uh, during the four shock sequence, and if you look in time at this, in this zone, I mean, you can you get this um, time series, so that's in years, and that's a row number of magnitude uh, above two earthquakes. And you see that, well, in 2005, there was uh, already a, um, an aftershock sequence, and you see, uh, you kind of see, you know, quite clearly at the end, actually, the acceleration just uh, two months before. And this is the declustered part, so on uh, getting, getting rid of all the aftershocks using our method. Uh, for example, here, all the aftershocks in 2005 have just disappeared because they have been classified as aftershocks. And you're left with something that is still accelerating, but not quite as significantly. But if you compute the derivative, so the rate, basically, and smooth it, uh, at 50 days or 150 day uh, um, durations, uh, smoothing, um, well smoothing, uh, you, s you, you see that at the very end um, the rate is actually the highest for uh, um, uh, is the highest for the 20 years period we studied. So it's clearly a sign that uh, you know there the, the rate of um, spontaneous earthquake was increased in the two months before, and that's clearly a sign of pre-slip. And uh, oh so I have two more minutes. So <laughs> Um, uh, it's actually, it ca I can actually be uh, visually seen directly on the aftershock sequence that uh, followed the main 7.3 for shocks. So again, it that occurred two, two days before the main shock. That's the main shock here, that's a map view the magnitude 9 hypocenter, and that's a 7.34 shock here. And all these guys here are aftershocks of the 7.3. That's the first day of aftershocks, and that's the second day of aftershocks. And what you see is, you know, the Aftershocks actually delay, de uh, sh well, kind of highlights um, the rupture zone, and here you still see the rupture zone, but you see something else. You see big aftershocks coming very close to the hypocenter, so there's a very strong migration, and that's passing by this aseismic zone here. And this migration, it's quite f a fast migration because it's only in two days, is extremely unusual. And for example, though, well that's only visual, but I'm going to give a, a more uh, robust argument uh, later. Uh, that's uh, all the 7.3 earthquakes that occur in this zone. That's exactly the same zone here, uh, uh, longitude and latitude here. That's the 7.3 for shock before the main shock here. And these are two 7.3 earthquakes that occur afterwards. And you see that uh, well in blue, that's the immediate uh, aftershocks, and in, in red, that's the uh, aftershocks in, uh, well, two days after. And you see there's no migration here, there's no migration here. Well, here the migration is quite strong. 
So it's very unusual, and you can actually do this in a, in a systematic way on the worldwide uh, earthquake um, data set. And this is something we did. We separated uh, main shocks that were preceded. So that's in time here. That's one year before, one year after. That's all the earthquakes of May sev 7 and above in, 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 in the Earth. Uh, and that's a number of earthquakes here. So you see the blue guys here are the ones that are preceded by four shocks, and the red guys, main shocks, are not preceded by four shocks. And what you see is that those that are preceded by four shocks tend to have more aftershocks, and those that have no four shocks tend to be followed by fewer aftershocks. And in my view, these aftershocks, these blue aftershocks, uh, tend also to migrate, while the red aftershocks do not migrate. Okay, um, and, uh, well, I should be quick. <laughs> um, so we believe by stacking here, we can actually uh, see, wha what we see here is a pre-slip starting before the main shock and continuing after the main shock and giving birth to more aftershocks. So the aftershock here are more, uh, um, um, um are more numerous because you know there was already some pre-sleep before that still is going on during the post-seismic uh, phase, and that is responsible for this uh, um, for this migration. So I should I should stop here. Uh, well, I was nearly finished, but uh, thank you. <laughs> Okay, yeah, well, here or here, uh, the raw data is basically you keep all the earthquakes. So, uh, but some of these earthquakes are actually triggered by just, you know, prior earthquakes. So there are aftershocks. There are normal aftershocks of prior earthquakes. While here, when you decluster, you get rid of the aftershocks. So what's what remains are earthquakes ca that, that cannot be explained as aftershocks of prior earthquakes. So they're due to something else. So basically, most of the time, you know, the, the straight line here, you know, it's basically the tectonic loading, but then on top of the tectonic loading, there's something else at the very end, and that's best seen by w looking at the derivative. Uh, there's not a length, length scale here, but uh, I mean, for this time series, uh, no, no, there's, there's no length scale. I mean, the, the, the we, take we, we use the rupture length of all the um, earthquakes no using well-known empirical laws, but Yeah, oh yeah, 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 yeah. So we, yeah, yeah, we, we, t we, we use uh, in the triggering kernel here, we use um, is this a sp uh, special component here so that, that looks at, you know, whether the earthquakes are neighbors of each other in space, yes. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, we here in that in that case, we actually looked at this target area because we were uh, trying to estimate whether you know pre-sleep could have occurred in this zone. But you can do it in a systematic way. If you, oh yeah, if you look at the brothers, but I mean, it's very likely because uh, just simply, if you look at you know what happened before, so that's today uh, again, two years before, and then two months bef uh, before, you see that it's starting to focus, you know. But so you, we we use this. If you look at a larger zone, then you know if pre-sleep only occur in this in this zone. So if you look at a larger zone, you're gonna lose this signal. Of course, yes. Oh yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah we don't we don't predict anything. No, no, we don't predict. No. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, but we want to evaluate whether you know. Yeah, but yeah, 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 yeah. yeah no, we actually do not. We make it. Uh, no we leave it to be non-stationary. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you can actually see it. That, that's w uh, that's why actually in the end. Um, sorry. 
Um, well, that's basically here. That's that's the background rate. So it's not it's not a constant. That's why I mean that's actually the time evolution of the background rate that tells you if there is some acceleration at the end. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 